Helium, this element that people keep saying we maybe are running out of, but we're not actually running out of. What is helium and why do we care? Helium is the second element on the periodic table, and it's the first of what are called the noble gases. The reason why those are all the way at the end there like that is because they are very not reactive, like super not reactive. You will not find compounds made with these atoms in nature. Helium is the lightest of the noble gases, and it actually is the second lightest element and also the second most abundant after hydrogen. But unlike hydrogen, helium is actually just the atom when it's a gas, unlike hydrogen gas, say, which is two hydrogen atoms and they're like sharing their one electron each, helium is just the one helium atom all on its lonely. And it's very happy to be that way. It doesn't need electrons. It doesn't want to give anybody electrons. And it doesn't even want to hang out with other helium atoms. That's part of why it's a gas. But this lack of reactivity kind of might make one wonder, well, how did we find it in the first place, right? Like if it just, just bumps around and floats away. Actually, we found helium because somebody was looking at the sun during an eclipse. But they were doing it the right way, the like science way with like filters and instruments and, you know, so please don't look into solar eclipses. There's nothing else to discover. Don't do that. So why were they looking at a solar eclipse in the sun? Like, why, why would you do that? Well, because you can find things out about that. The sun is comprised of mostly hydrogen and also some helium and like trace amounts of other elements that have been made as the sun fuses hydrogen and other elements into heavier atoms. The light that comes from the sun and any star is more or less determined by what that star is made out of. So a good way to figure out what the what a star is made out of is to observe the spectral lines that come from its light. And how do you do this? There are a number of different ways and we have better ways of doing it now. But one of the old school ways was to take the light when it could be focused into a kind of a beam and then pass that through a diffraction device, like a piece of quartz crystal. You've seen the Pink Floyd album cover like that. And what happens is if it's not just the full spectrum of light, you'll get specific colors that show up more prominently than others. And that is a direct result of what that source of light is made out of. And in this case, the sun. So now after doing this experiment, both of these astronomers, Jules Janssen and Norman Lockyer, both found out that, hey, wait, there's an extra line in here that we hadn't noticed at some other point in time. What is that? And it was about 30 years later when somebody was finally able to confirm that that was in fact a new element and that element they named helium because they found it in the sun. So the Greek word for sun, helios, helium. That's where we get that one from. So now when this chemist, Sir William Ramsey, discovered and figured out that this was a new element, helium, he didn't actually discover it from the sun because, you know, we didn't, we weren't going up to the sun to collect samples, right? It actually was found in an ore a type of uranite ore, because the other way that helium forms, interestingly enough, is from radioactive decay of radioactive elements, in particular, uranium and thorium. So when that nucleus of the atom gets too unstable and it needs to spit out a little particle in order to get to a more stable state, that little particle, a lot of times an alpha particle, is a helium nucleus with two protons and two neutrons, and it'll run into literally anything and just snatch two electrons from it. And suddenly you've got helium. And it turns out that in 1903, it was discovered that there was a lot of helium that had just gotten absorbed by natural gas deposits, notably in the US, but pretty much everywhere else. Helium doesn't really dissolve in things, but it can get trapped. And it just so happens that natural gas is really good at trapping helium up to like 7% in volume. As luck would have it, it was the US military who figured out that these helium deposits were here. And this was around the time that we were interested in using it as a lift gas for dirigibles and other kinds of wartime efforts. So the US military did what it does. And it was like, oh, we're going to make sure we got a lot of, we're going to make sure we got all the helium. All of it. And we did. We actually had quite the reserve of helium for a few decades until the U.S. decided that we should just sell it because what are we using it for? Like, we don't need this. It's not that big a deal. And it's it's one of those weird kind of hindsight is beautiful and painful at the same time situations because 
before we realized how useful helium could be and used, the U.S. had already decided it was going to just get rid of this massive stockpile of it. And that's kind of where the shortage happened. So now, the big concern behind a shortage of helium, though, comes from a use that was relatively recently figured out. The major use for helium today is not actually the balloons that you see. The major use is for cooling superconducting magnets and MRI machines and NMR machines, which are actually kind of the same thing, but the NMR machine is what I use when I'm analyzing my little molecule samples. The MRI machine is for human samples, but they do literally the same thing. And both of them require a really strong magnetic field, like an insanely powerful magnetic field in order to do what they do. You might imagine magnetic field strength kind of has to do with the size of the magnet, right? Mostly right. But there are ways around this problem. For example, there are electromagnets. And these run based on the principle that when you have electrons or any kind of current running through a wire or any kind of conductor, it generates a magnetic field that is in all ways, shape, or form the same as any other magnet. And these are electromagnets. But even these, if you want to get them really strong, you still kind of got to make them really big. So what are we to do? Well, there exists this property called superconductivity and man, is it magical. So when you have like a pipe right in your bathroom and you got water going through it, if it's clogged, the water can't go through very easily. The same is kind of true of electrons moving through a conductor when you have electricity happening. There are still atoms in this metal that the electrons might bump into or got to move around. But if you cool metals down to less than, say, 50 Kelvin, you kind of lose that property. Those electrons don't bump into the atoms anymore. They don't bump into anything anymore. They just kind of like flow. They just kind of right through that metal like no problem. And what this means is that you can pump so many more electrons through that metal, which means that the magnetic field you get from that is way stronger. Now, in order to cool this, these metals down to make these superconducting magnets, you need something that can, that's that cold, that's like less than 50 Kelvin. In walks helium. Helium, because of it being a noble gas, does not solidify under normal conditions. It is a gas down to about 10 Kelvin, at which point it becomes a liquid. And as you might imagine, you know, if you take cold water and pour it on something hot, it, the, the hot thing gets cold. So if you take really cold liquid helium and you pour it on your superconducting magnet, it gets cold enough to be a superconducting magnet and stay that way. And that is the real major use of helium is to get things super, 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 super. One eternity later. Super, super cold, like super cold. The coldest anything can be is liquid helium. So the same way that liquid nitrogen is really cold when you make it when you take nitrogen gas and you make it into a liquid, helium is even colder. Liquid helium is one of the coldest things in the universe and it's used for these superconducting magnets and a few other cryogenic applications, but that's one of that's kind of the big big main huge concern for having a shortage of helium because then MRI machines don't work and a lot of our modern diagnostic tools are kind of in jeopardy at that point. Incidentally, it's also used as a cover gas in a lot of high-end electronics manufacturing and the making of the materials necessary for the circuit board components that go into most modern devices today. In the manufacture of a lot of specialty electronics, you've got to work with like tiny, tiny pieces of material that have to be pretty much perfect. And as it turns out, the oxygen we breathe well, it keeps us alive because it's kind of a reactive gas and we can use it to do reactions in our body. But it also reacts with a lot of things out in just like the world and the environment. The rust that you see on old pieces of metal is actually that metal reacting with the oxygen in the air. So when you're doing specialty manufacturing or very sensitive chemistry or some other tasks, you really need to keep that oxygen out of the equation. And one of the ways you can do this is by working in what's called a glove box or a glove room, which is just a sealed room or container that usually has like two big gloves. You've seen, you've probably seen pictures of these on like TV shows, of like scientists doing science. Um, but these 
chambers, they pull all the air out of it and then replace that air with helium. Sometimes they'll use argon as well, but helium is actually kind of the gas of choice in a lot of situations. So you might be wondering, well, all right, so we need it. We sold off what we had. Why don't we just get more of it? Getting more of it isn't exactly easy. So it's kind of abundant in natural gas, but not all natural gas deposits have the same amount. And the ones that do still have helium haven't necessarily been tapped yet. And even the ones that have been tapped, we haven't exactly been extracting for the helium. We've been extracting for the natural gas and then, you know, we save the helium as we can. So we need better technologies to be able to get more of the helium that's left. And then we also need to actually find more of these sources that we know they're there. We just have to dig for them and then actually hit them and extract the helium from them. So it's going to take time. But the unfortunate reality is that because we had a huge stockpile and then we sold off that huge stockpile, there wasn't exactly a lot of development into ways to get helium because it seemed like we had way more than we would ever need. But then along came those superconducting magnets and we were like, whoa, 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 wait, we need it. Wait, nope, nope, we need way more of it. Oh God. Projections at this point suggest that as long as we are responsible about our helium usage now, we should be fine. So don't worry too much about the party balloons, but if you really want to get the 30% oxygen mixture with helium, one, it's safer and two, uses less helium. Yeah, the future of helium is a little funky because it's intrinsically tied to us still extracting fossil fuels from the ground, even though we are trying to some degree or another to move to a more renewable, less carbon fueled future. So there will hopefully come a point where we're pulling natural gas out of the ground just for the helium. And then maybe we use a little bit of the natural gas to make my raw material so I can do my job. But if you enjoyed this video and you thought it was cool, appreciate you hit that like button. Until next time, Skim Thug.